With Warp Tour coming back in whatever form, I thought it made sense to take a look back and see where Warp Tour came from, how it became the massive behemoth it was, what it meant to so many people, and then maybe even share my thoughts a little bit on what I think about the future of Warp Tour. So, this is the story of Warp Tour, at least so far. People kept wanting Ajax back, so he has decided to grace us with his presence for at least the start of this video. If you end up enjoying this video, if you like music history content, please give the video a like and consider subscribing so you won't miss out on more stories like this from music history. I've got some fun videos planned and in the works, so subscribe so you don't miss that. Also, if you want a bigger say in what I cover next, consider becoming a member. It's only a couple bucks a month. It's probably still not worth it, but I'll post polls for you to vote on the next topic I cover, and then I'll probably be more likely to take recommendations from members over just regular subscribers or regular viewers. So before we get started in this story, I think one of the coolest things about studying music history is hearing personal stories related to the artists and bands and topics that I cover. So I wanted to share a bit about my personal story with Warp Tour, my history of this iconic festival, just kind of let you know where I'm coming from when I'm approaching this subject. I grew up in a pretty small town in Northeast Tennessee where Warp Tour came nowhere near. I think the closest would have been like a four and a half hour drive. And my parents were not willing to do that. I wasn't willing to do that. I was also discovering music and what I liked before social media was really ubiquitous. I didn't really have anyone telling me about these things. So I didn't know about Warp Tour at all until I found a compilation CD. I think it was like the 2006 or seven or five, one of those compilation that Warp Tour would release at the end of every tour. I just saw that, I think, like in FYE, and I noticed some bands that I really liked on that, so I was like, I have no idea what this is, but interesting. Picked it up, and from there, just started learning more about what Warp Tour was, and it always became a personal goal of mine to actually go to one, but that seemed unlikely, until I moved to Nashville, and Warp Tour decided to make a stop in Nashville, so I was finally able to attend in 2014. And that kind of felt like the culmination of so much of my childhood and life up to that point. Like Warp Tour was this mecca almost. So I very much felt like I was taking a scene kid pilgrimage to Warp Tour. It was a great day. I loved it. Still have so many good memories from that day. So I can officially say that I went to Warp Tour, the original iteration of it, even if it was past its prime. It wasn't like that early 2000s height of Warp Tour mania, but I still went to Warp Tour back in its heyday. All right, so with that, let's get into the history of Warp Tour. Kevin Lyman was born in 1961 and raised in Pomona, California as one of four adopted children and fell in love with concerts in college. He said that he grew up in a family that really valued hard work. His dad worked hard and his mother took care of four kids, so he learned that if you wanted something, you had to work for it. He said that they grew up without allowances or without anything like that. It was very much if there was something that you wanted, you had to earn it. He went to college at California State Polytechnic University, Pomona, and said it wasn't really clicking with him. He couldn't decide on that one thing he wanted to focus on, so one day he was just walking around campus and he saw some people playing music and setting up a PA system for a show. He walked over, introduced himself, and they clicked and started getting along and that's kind of his introduction into planning events and music in general really. He just fell in love with the concept of both rock music and event promotion and he had a van in college so he would pile all of his friends into that van and drive them to Los Angeles to start going to the clubs to see some of these live bands. He said at that time, I mean it was the early 80s, so he was super into more of the new wave scene than any kind of like underground punk that was also blossoming in LA around that time. After he graduated, he first went to Hawaii where he worked at a 
weight loss camp for women. He said it was a very unserious job. He said, quote, it was still that non-serious. What am I going to do? I'm going to go to Hawaii. Naturally, what are you going to do after going to college for four years? Just go run a weight loss camp in Hawaii. Once he came back from Hawaii, he was still trying to figure out what he wanted to do. He was basically broke, just running youth camps and summer camps. His degree was in recreational management, so he had that background. He had that knowledge. He knew what it took from a logistics standpoint to put on an event, but he was still a little lost. He didn't really know what he wanted to do. He knew he didn't want to run these youth summer camps for the rest of his life, and that's when a friend suggested that he go to Fender's Ballroom in Los Angeles. It was a club that was looking for people to be stage managers for their shows, and that friend suggested Kevin look into that because... Kevin used to put on shows in college, and the pay was like 75 bucks a night, which sounded pretty good to him at that point. Since most of those shows were kind of underground punk and metal bands, there wasn't a lot of attention to detail within the teams, so the bands would get really impressed when Kevin managed to fulfill their writers and make sure they had everything they needed in order to put on a good show. That sounds like the bare minimum of what a stage manager is supposed to do, but... In the club scenes in those days, it wasn't really happening, so whenever it did, it stood out. Around this same time, a friend of his from college started a company called Golden Voice, which was like a concert promotion company. They would eventually go on to start Coachella, but that's a story for a different day. So Kevin was able to partner with Golden Voice for some of these shows in these LA clubs. He said he was working 320 shows a year, working at any club in LA that he could find, working when other people were not and were relaxing. He said that working these club dates was essentially his way of socializing, so he wasn't hanging out with people when he wasn't working, and he was just working all the time as much as he could. So over the years, he just built his reputation as a concert promoter and became friends with a lot of these underground punk bands that he would soon help springboard into superstardom. As he was building his reputation and showing these bands that he was responsible and could help them put on a really good show, he started to book more and more gigs until eventually some of those bands started to outgrow the LA club scene and become much bigger and they took him with them. Bands like Jane's Addiction. He said, quote, I started doing these shows, but also realizing I didn't want to do it forever. I didn't want to be in that club. I didn't want to become that person just bumming people out, end quote. What he means by that is he said there was always that one person at every show that seems like they just made it their job to make sure that every person going to that concert had a bad time, just kind of on them about every little thing and he said that was always a sign that someone had been there too long and they were a little too cynical and a little too jaded so he didn't want to be that in these club scenes he didn't want to be that guy that was just giving people a hard time he wanted to always have that feeling that going to a concert could be the best night of your life and it was going to be a fun time for everyone he wanted to always feel that and he was starting to lose that a little bit through just sounds like burnout from working in the clubs too much so when Lollapalooza was getting started they brought Kevin in to be the first stage manager in 1991 he said about joining that first tour quote I had no idea what I was doing down there end quote. He said before that he had never been on the road. He didn't do tours. He didn't know what that life was like, but it sounded fun, and he knew Jane's addiction from his time in the clubs, so it made sense, and he jumped in, and he stuck with it for a couple of years, playing different roles within Lollapalooza, kind of moving up the ladder a little bit. He also said about his experience with Lollapalooza, quote, and then in 92, I went out again as a stage manager, but ended up assuming a lot of the production manager roles because one of our touring production people had a very serious addiction problem. I didn't know how to deal with it. All I did was know how to do his job for him. He stuck with Lollapalooza until 1995 when he was thinking about retiring from the concert industry entirely. His first daughter was coming soon, so he thought it might make sense to kind of get a more normal job with stuff like health insurance and regular hours. So he planned on doing one last event that he was entirely responsible for, kind of giving himself a challenge to prove that he could do it, to prove that he could solely put on a really good show. It was going to be his send-off to concert promotion, and originally he wanted to call it The Bomb because, you know, it's The Bomb. It's like that old slang phrase that sounds super dated now, but the Oklahoma City bombing happened right before he planned on announcing that name, so he had to do a pretty quick rebrand. Because he knew a lot of the bands from the skate culture scene of the 90s through his work in the LA clubs and his work on Lollapalooza, he knew he wanted it to 
tie in to that skate culture, so he started approaching some of those bands to play on his tour. Kevin said about this idea to start his own thing, quote, I think I had no other option but to start something, to be honest. I don't think I'm employable. I have a hard time being employed. Kevin partnered with a guy named Ray Woodbury, who was the president of RK Diversified Entertainment, to launch the Warp Tour on June 21st, 1995 in Boise, Idaho. It was also tied to the short-lived Warp magazine, which is like a skate magazine. They were kind of a dime a dozen back then. The show ran for 24 dates in two months, wrapping in Detroit on August 18th, 1995. Kevin said, quote, We did 24 dates that first year, which is pretty ambitious. We probably should have done a couple of them and come home, but I've always tended to go for it, and the promoters were willing to give us a chance because the tour was different from other touring festivals out there at the time. End quote. He said he picked the bands to play by basically just asking his friends. He said, quote, It was a very eclectic lineup for that time, and then I grabbed some skaters. Steve Salvo was a friend of mine, and he rounded up a few other skaters, and we headed out on the road, got it together within a few months, and went out and did 25 cities. That original lineup did feature a lot of underground punk bands who would use the Warp Tour to springboard the group onto further success, which kind of became a template with Warp Tour bands down the road. But it also showcased Kevin's kind of eclectic music taste that featured reggae acts, it featured grunge and metal, it also had skateboarding exhibitions happening everywhere they went. Two of the bigger buzz bands going into Warp Tour were a group called Quicksand, who were really popular in the underground. People were expecting them to kind of be the next big thing, but unfortunately they broke up the same year as the first Warp Tour. And another group called L7, which was a grunge band who were already pretty well established in the scene. There were several bands who used that first Warp Tour to kind of launch them into future success. Bands like No Use for a Name, Deftones, No Doubt, Sublime, and many others. While I was researching for this video, I saw, I think, Loud Wire posted an article about like the bands on the original lineup, who they were, what happened to them afterwards, but it was kind of basic. They didn't go into that much detail, so I thought that could be an interesting video, just looking at all of the bands on the original Warp Tour, where they were before Warp Tour, what happened to them after it. So if you're interested in that, let me know in the comments, and then maybe that'll be a future video. After that first tour ended, Kevin immediately started working on the next year's tour, which was set to be even bigger. Before that next year's tour started, Kevin almost accepted an offer from Calvin Klein to be like the main title sponsor, but at the last minute, Vans offered him $300,000 to be the main sponsor, so he took that instead, and I think we can all agree that that was the right decision. Kevin said, quote, I almost made a really bad deal, and it almost became the Calvin Klein Warp Tour. Can you imagine? We wouldn't be sitting here talking. That would have been just a big branding mistake. And Vans got involved, and I promised them I would promote amateur skating as long as they wanted to, end quote. Vans was really heavily into the extreme sports and skating culture, so that brand fit just really made a ton of sense. To make the rest of this very long story very short, Vans Warped Tour ran until 2018 and became a staple of the alternative and emo and pop punk scene. The Vans Warped Tour carried on Kevin's love of eclectic music and would feature a whole range of different acts from different genres, but it also carried on that tradition of giving underground punk and pop punk and alternative bands their first platform to get their music out there to a much wider audience and find some success. Bands like Avenged Sevenfold, Katy Perry, Paramore, Black Eyed Peas, Sum 41, Fall Out Boy, and BB Rexa all use Warp Tour to have incredible success after it. But then in 2018, after 25 years, Kevin announced that Warp Tour would be ending. They did three dates in 2019 as like a celebratory 25th anniversary send-off. I think it was in New Jersey, Ohio, and California. Bands like Andrew WK, Good Charlotte, A Day to Remember, Wage War, Bowling for Soup played those last shows. People naturally speculated about what made Kevin decide to end the Warp Tour. People were saying it must have lost a lot of money, and the whole idea of a traveling festival was kind of over anyway. No one else was really doing that at the time. The logistics of it no longer made financial sense. But Kevin stressed that that wasn't the reason he decided to end it. The reason that, according to him, he decided to shut down Warp Tour was because he didn't see the unity in the punk 
culture anymore. The unity that propelled Warped Tour just wasn't there anymore. He said, quote, It took a community to make Warped Tour go. Some of that was self-inflicted. I thought you addressed the fans that complain on Twitter. I was addressing everyone and tried to keep the conversation going. But you realize that you can't really negotiate, debate, or educate on social media. End quote. He also claimed that certain bands started to become too judgmental. He said that when he would approach these bands to play at Warped Tour, some of them would turn them down because they didn't want to be seen as a warped band. They didn't want to be associated with some of the bands that traditionally played every warp tour. Kevin said, quote, every year I'd send offers and just, we don't want to tour with those bands. We don't want to be a warped-esque band. And it's like, dude, warped-esque bands? You mean Bad Religion, A Day to Remember, Paramore? It got very frustrating, end quote. It sounds like Kevin was just burnt out after doing this for so long, and the scene just wasn't what it was when he first entered it back in the late 80s and early 90s, so it kind of makes sense that it ran its course and he was ready to step back from it, though I have seen people say that that 2017 tour took a massive financial loss, so if that's true... That probably definitely impacted Kevin's decision, even if he denies that. I think if the tour was still like a massive success, making tons of money, it's very unlikely that he would just step away from it. At least in my opinion, maybe maybe I'm wrong about that. Despite the lifelong memories that I and so many other people in the alternative music scene made at Warp Tour, there was a darker side to it that I think needs to at least be addressed in any video like this. It's no secret that Warp Tour was really popular with high schoolers and even younger age people. There were a ton of underage fans there to see these bands who most of them were not underage and these fans like saw these bands as gods essentially. As a website called College Media Network wrote, quote, as acts started to take advantage of the number of young girls making the pilgrimage to the festival to witness their favorite musicians take the stage, the pop punk scene no longer seemed like a safe place. However terrible of an issue this was, it didn't seem to bother Kevin Lyman. There was a particular artist known as Front Porch Step who allegedly met underage fans at Warped and then started abusive relationships with them and those allegations started coming to light in 2014. Despite those allegations coming out, Kevin kind of quietly booked Front Porch Step to play the Nashville date of Warp Tour that year, which prompted people like Haley Williams of Paramore to tweet, quote, I still believe in you, scene. Demand better because you deserve better. No more excuses for boys just being boys, end quote. After enough backlash happened, but also it's worth noting, Front Porch Step's set at that Warp Tour was packed. It was like in a little tent, and he posted a photo of just fans out there out the door for his set, including some pretty young fans like in the front row, which it's not great. But Kevin eventually after the backlash finally commented on that and said it was kind of like a one-off rehabilitation thing, which is just a lot of thoughts on that. There's also other artists who are allowed to continue on the tour despite allegations that if true, meant they should be nowhere near any underage fans. People like Davey Vanity from Blood on the Dance Floor, who was allowed to continue playing the entire tour after allegations came out about his abuse. Alleged abuse. Sorry, I gotta cover my bases there. Part of that was just the scene. I mean, in recent years, it's no secret that pop punk in the emo world has proven to be pretty predatory, so that was just kind of happening in the scene, unfortunately. But a lot of people think that Kevin didn't go far enough to protect the attendees at his festival, especially the underage girls. Though Kevin does claim that every single allegation was taken seriously. He said, quote, All are dug into thoroughly once they are brought to my attention, which is usually after I book someone. So that should dispel the reason I put them on is because they are controversial, end quote. But people push back on that, saying that Kevin was super vehement that bands stop prompting audiences to form mosh pits and circle pits and walls of death because of the insurance liabilities that that caused and he was not nearly as adamant to stop the predatory behavior from his artist on the warp tour once these things started happening kevin did start holding meetings with the bands before every warp tour warning them and educating them on proper behavior with fans and he would start letting parents into warp tour for free so that they could keep a better eye on their children he also reiterated a zero tolerance policy for things like this saying quote they will be dealt with when there is proof but i cannot judge by the court of the internet End quote. There's also been some noted misogyny from certain bands on the Warp Tour, bands like Attila and Amir, who sold some really kind of aggressively misogynistic merch at Warp Tour. At the end of the day, I think.
think Paul Adler, writing for Q Point, summed it up best when he said, quote, To be clear, the swelling tide of physical and sexual violence in the music industry is not exclusive to Warped. Think R. Kelly, Chris Brown, and Ted Nugent. And it's not Warped Tour's fault, but it is Warped Tour's problem. At some point, more aggressive measures against the presence of physical or sexual violence may need to be enacted. At some point, someone's going to have to take a stand. End quote. But after focusing on the negative darker side, I think it's also worth noting some of the positive and good things that Kevin was able to do with Warped. He always made sure to partner with nonprofits and charities and encouraged all of the bands to volunteer in the local communities whenever the Warped Tour had a break day. He was really serious about the opioid epidemic that was happening and trying to provide resources and care and help for people who were suffering with addiction. He said, quote, The majority of my early Warped Tour crew guys all had to spend a little time in jail for stupid decisions. A lot of them were selling meth or whatever and did their time. Time, and I gave them their second chance, and that built a loyalty, giving a second chance to people, end quote. He partnered with a nonprofit group called FIND, which created an app that was designed to educate young people specifically on the dangers of uh, opioids and addiction, and that work helped him get a humanitarian award from Billboard. After Warped Tour ended, Kevin became a teacher at the USC Thornton School of Music. He also owned a record label called Side One Dummy Records, and has continued his philanthrop- and has continued his philanthrop- and has continued his philanthropic efforts philanthropic philan- philanthropic goodness continued his philanthropic efforts he's also on several different boards and is the ceo of the kevin lyman group an event management firm pretty recently in october of 2024 kevin announced that warp tour will be returning for the summer of 2025 he said that he always hoped someone would come along and do it better but no one ever did he said quote people start remembering once something's gone that it was important it was fun and i'm hoping to recapture a lot of that again end quote from like the moment of the first initial announcement fans are kind of understandably concerned because of live nations involvement in it once more details came out it became apparent that this warp tour would be very different from warp tours of the past there's only going to be three stops and each stop is two days instead of just the one day with multiple stops and tickets i think they haven't gone on sale yet but it was announced that they're going to be like 150 bucks for both days and no bands have been announced though i think the only one we're pretty confident about is falling in reverse if i've read that correctly but bands will start being announced in 2025 is what kevin said so all that being said what are my thoughts as if you care to hear them about this reiteration of warp tour this kind of relaunching of it and when I first read the details as they came out, my initial reaction was it's just it's not Warp Tour. Like it doesn't feel like Warp Tour. The thing that made Warp Tour so special to me was the tour. It was the idea that all of these bands were going around to so many different places in the US playing for one day with all of these bands and then they would move on to the next city and that's just not going to happen when it's three cities across like five months like it just that feels different it just feels like a couple different festivals that are happening in different parts of the city and not warp tour i do like that i say only 150 dollars, but some of these festivals get really expensive so i like that they at least tried to keep prices as reasonable as they possibly could i can't imagine it being any cheaper than that unfortunately so 150 is decent i think in my opinion i'll be interested to see what kind of bands sign on to play if it's going to be the same bands at each festival or if they're going to mix it up a little bit i'm undecided if i'm going to go obviously there's none anywhere close to me so i would have to travel to go to one and i don't know that i'm willing to do that but we'll see maybe i'll report back if i do but that's the history of warp tour that's where it came from that's where it's headed next year let me know your thoughts. What is your experience with Warp Tour? Did you ever get to go to one? How did you feel about it? What are your thoughts on this new tour that's just been announced? Use the comments below and let me know. Like this video if you liked it. And consider subscribing so you don't miss out on more stories like this from music history.